Yeah, all right, luckily. So you can do the elective cases now. We might start maybe next week onwards, not now. Okay. And, and, and was, was Corona heavy in your place, in your hospital? The numbers are there, but uh, mortality is still not Sir, so we bad. are live? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so can we, yeah. Hi, friends. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a nice weather now, and it's a wonderful webinar today. We have our old friend, Dr. Yap William, and I think everybody in Indian Arthroscopy Society from many, many years have been knowing Yap, and he has been training and teaching and actively involved in many meetings of Indian Arthroscopy Society. Uh, it's been more than 20 years, Yap, that you have been visiting with India, or maybe more. We welcome yes. you again to the meeting, and he is uh, going to talk on something which is not yet covered in any of our webinars, and that is posterior shoulder instability. Incidentally, Yap is uh, a good member of uh, Indian Shoulder and Elbow Society as well. And that is the reason he has always been associated with training and teaching of all Indian arthroscopy members. Welcome, Yap, uh, Thank to you. our webinar. And uh, you. you can maybe uh, speak something and then maybe go to the presentation. Yeah. Okay. That's a pleasure. Well, once again, IPS, well, we know they're from at least 20 years, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, so many meetings. And I'm so happy that the IAS is still such a strong organization, getting bigger and bigger. How many members there are at the moment? So we have more than 3,500, yeah. Wow. I can remember when we, when we started, there were about 40, 50 people around. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Impressive. It's a long right? journey. It's been a long journey. A long journey, but a good journey. And I think you have, well, you have such so very many active members, very active in clinical work, in scientific work, and always amazed by the big number of patients you, uh, you, see, you see and you, you treat. And with all the modern modalities, it is impressive. Progress has been made. So we shall were I lucky start? that we had good teachers like you in our okay. initial yeah, practice. Yeah, Thank so you. we should start, yeah. Yes, all right, I share the screen. There we come. Okay, there we go. Um, I will cover uh, the, let me see, the uh, whole area of posterior instability I would like to discuss. Some short, some a little bit more extensive, talking about the complete traumatic dislocation, locked as well as recurrent, more time even on a traumatic subluxation which is more frequent than we normally assumed. A little bit about voluntary instability and the most challenging area in post instability, the voluntary one turned into involuntary instability, which is really a challenge. Well, a little bit on the etiology. It can be traumatic, very often micro trauma in throwers or other sports where there is a high force backward in the posterior direction and some atraumatic, which is debatable. A dislocation without trauma, most of the time is micro trauma. So this is mainly the involuntary instability. Well, in the traumatic cases, you see most of the time less laxity. In the atraumatic types, there is more laxity of the shoulder. So there is a little bit over a little bit overlap between hyperlexity and mild micro instability. Something for debate maybe at the end. Well, this is traumatic. You quite often see recurrent dislocation. And here it is more the provocative tests than it is really a history of a dislocation. And that is quite important because the, the posterior instability People don't complain about instability. They, they have a little bit of pain and not so much the feeling of in instability. And for these, the provocative tests are very important. Well, it can be unidirectional, just posterior, multidirectional, that is posterior, often combined with inferior. And you should really examine the patients for both directions. But sometimes you even see it in an combination of anterior and posterior instability. So this is very rare, but it happens. 
well, we were discussing about involuntary. It has been caused by a trauma or micro trauma. And the voluntary, we'll talk about later. These are the young ladies, most of the time, who are able to push the shoulder out of the joint without any, any trauma. Well, the most severe form of instability is the complete traumatic dislocation. I just want to point out that uh, quite often you see it with a fracture. As on the left picture, you see the fracture line on the CT scan. If you just do are performing an X-ray and you see a post dislocation and you try to reduce this one blind without properly knowing the pathoanatomy, you easily can break off the head and you have a complete loose head, which is most of the time going to fail and to lead to an avascular necrosis. So I think for all, and that's what I train my residents, for all my traumatic posterior dislocations, I want to have a CT scan to rule out a fracture, which make a reduction a little bit more challenging. You should do it open in my position. It is too dangerous to do it uh, uh, closed. Otherwise, you will lose the head. The locked posterior dislocation, well, all well known to you. You're all experienced. You will never miss it on the ER, but quite often patient will be referred to you. There's still a poor range of motion after the dislocation. The emergency doctor originally said, well, it has been reduced. It looks fine. And they come three months later with this posterior dislocation. And that is the problem that the view, if you look to the left picture, it is not a clear AP view. You don't look along the glenoid surface. And it should be, in, if you have an AP view, you more easily can find the dislocation. And very important, if you have an eye view of an, or an outlet view, you easily can find here the glenoid and the head not in a proper position towards the glenoid. So this is so often, so often happening. And that is still, even in the Netherlands, in well-trained uh, surgeons, they miss it because they are not very much shoulder interested and they are not much very eager to do a proper X-ray examination. Normally, if you have these two pictures, it is, uh, you can see it if you done properly. But if you have an axial or a Velpo view, you can determine the other direction. And, and CT scan is even better. This is a case of a guy who had an an uh, insult, he had an, an uh, uh, after using drugs, he had an epileptic insult and he had a posterior dislocation with that one side of fracture. There's a case, there was a guy treated on the ER department. He was treated for a fracture. He had no range of motion in the shoulder or poor range of motion, lack of external rotation, and he had an nice plate, a nice cruise in it, but only one year later, the first axial view was made when he was referred to me and you see the posterior dislocation. So it can easily be missed in combination with proximal humor fractures. It can happen. Well, what about the treatment of the lock dislocation? Well, acute without fracture, you can do a closed reduction, either under anesthesia or, or plexus. If it is chronic, I would suggest to do an open reduction, and we can discuss about the technique if there are, there's quite some debate how you could do it. Well, when once reduced, you can use an allograft or an autograft to fill the defect. Quite often the re reverse hill sex is quite big. You can do a McLaughlin procedure, a minor tuberosity transfer, or you do in a long-standing case, all the patient and hemi shoulder arthroplasty. Well, I like in the, in the acute dislocation to try to save the cartilage. As you see here on the middle of the, the picture, you see the impressed cartilage. And this is a piece of the, of the minor tuberosity. And if you level this up and you fill it with cancerous bone in between, you can correct the circumference of the humeral head. Quite easy procedure. It is, in, interior, it is anterior in the joint, easy to reach but it is very worthwhile to try to restore the head in the acute cases. Well, I love allograft, but you can use iliacrest autograft as long as your graft is a little bit below the level of the defect. I use either humeral head or femoral head allograft. 
size the defect and fix it a little bit below the level of the original head. This screws sunken. Normally there's a layer of metaplasia or fibrous tissue coming on in it and you can uh, prevent a recurrence of the dislocation with this, uh, with this reconstruction. Well, sometimes it is not a lot dislocation. They can recur and have a recurrent traumatic dislocation. And it is a case where you see here what I call the posterior alpsa, the, post, the pulpsa. Here you see here the labrum is detached and migrated more medially. And here you see the large reverse ill sex. This is a lesion. It was a 45 year old alcoholic. He refused an arthroscopy. I was considering to repair this one and to do an, what we call a reversed um, remplissage, where you can fix the subscap into the defect. It is as easy as the remplissage posterior. You put in one or two screws and you fix the tendon here and you prevent this one locking again in the posterior glenoid. Well, the recurrent traumatic subluxation, either acute or recurrent microtraumata, we will discuss it later, especially in throwers and that sort of athletes. The symptoms, quite often, they don't come to your office complaining about instability. They feel uncomfortable in the shoulder. It might slip slightly over the glenoid, but most of the time they complain of posterior shoulder pain. So each patient with a history of micro or, or uh, macro uh, trauma, just complaining of post, posterior shoulder pain, realize that it might well be a posterior problem. Well, this all the type of sports where there's more huge forces, either due to a fall or by, pushed by rugby or by American football, these are the sports where it happens. And it's interestingly, this guy, Owen, he worked for the military in the United States. He looked to 714 young athletes in the army and he just followed them. He did a proper instability uh, instant examination when they entered the army and he looked to them four years later and he found about 47 with anterior instability after these four years, heavy sports in the army. And he found two guys of seven guys with a posterior instability. And the main finding was that all these with post instability and athletes, that they had an increased retroversion. The retroversion, as you all know, the angle of Friedman, normally it is seven degrees, but in these it was the mean of 70. So those with an original, little bit of glenoid dysplasia had an easier, had a uh, higher chance of developing posterior instability. Well, what about the diagnostic tests in this posterior subluxation or posterior instability? In my hands, the jerk test is the most reliable test. The posterior load and shift to a lesser extent, not that very reliable. The same with the posterior apprehension test. And the hyperlexity test, the silk sign, is be very helpful to either detect hyperlexity or if there is difference in between, if there is inferior instability as well, combined posterior and inferior instability of the, uh, of the shoulder. So this is the jerk test. It's a dynamic test, St simulates posterior subluxation, an axial posterior load onto her arm flexed at 90 degrees, adducted and internally rotated. And here you see how it is done. You push the arm posterior and it flips back. So with the pushing on the elbow out of the joint and it reduces at this level of the scapular elevation. So with antiflexion and another example, it is painful in this case, as you see here. And when it is painful in combination with the, the, the here, with the positive test, it is very, very probably a posterior labor pathology. I also found it in my patients. Kim was the first, Kim from Korea was the first to describe this test, but it is a highly reliable test. Positive jerk test with pain is very, very often a posterior labrum 
or labor and capsule lesion. Well, what about the pathophysiology and anatomy in this posterior instability? It can be congenital variations, it can be secondary bone deformities, and there are capsule and labral problems. Well, this is the glenoid dysplasia. We define it as a congenital severe retroversion of the glenoid. It's quite different what we see in arthritis with a mild, re retro, uh, mild erosion posterior. This is congenital. And in these cases, as said earlier, there's a higher chance of posterior instability. What can we see as bony changes from posterior instability? <clears throat> this is a classical bony banker posteriorly. There's a mild reverse heel sex. This is a normal, normal bare area, but here's a minor impression. Here you see a posterior bony banker in a, on a CT scan, the same here. Two particles. This was fixed in a little bit more inferior position. And here you see a CT artogram with a huge bony defect. There is still soft tissue here, but here you see the large defect on the posterior glenoid. Well, this is important. You see here the anterior part of the joint, a chondral, I call it a chondral reverse hill sex. Very minor. So this is the subscap. Here, the anterior labrum, and if you look here, this is very with a minor, especially in lax patients, you just only see a chondral damage. And here you see the posterior detachment of the labrum, very obvious posterior banker, quite familiar in this post instability. You can see here like a um, pertus like lesion, the labrum together with the capsule is detached. As you can see here, there is a mild decreased retroversion of the glenoid. And in the video, this was in combination with a partial slap lesion, but the whole posterior labrum here was detached and it was a typical pertus lesion. Here, this is the posterior labrum lesion, which you quite often, where you should look at specifically is here, a capsule lesion, which I was shown here, the capsule lesions, you should address this capsule lesion together with the labrum. So you should be aware that there can be capsule lesions. And if there is no labor, if there is no banquet lesion, no bone lesion, you can have a reversed haggel, a regal. This is the anterior part of the joint. You see here the posterior part, some fibers of the capsule, but here's the capsule completely detached from the humerus. This is muscle around here. I will show this video again because it's quite important. And we'll look from the back, left shoulder, this is the anterior band of the anterior capsule, inferior capsule, some fibers here of the capsule, but here it is completely detached from the humerus. Quite easy to repair, just like a remplissage, quite easy, but you should not miss it. So it is part of your full examination of the shoulder when you suspect an instability. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the Kim's lesion. It's also related to posterior subluxations and small cyst formation, probably due to a small rupture in the uh, labrum. And it is shown here this is an example where there is some small opening here. If you carefully open it up here, you can see what has been shown here on the MRI arthrogram, some cyst, there is some leakage of the fluid in here, and it is a sort of paralabral cyst related to the posterior subluxation. Well, this is the voluntary subluxation. That is especially seen in younger ladies where they push the shoulder out. So it is quite important to distinguish this with a traumatic involuntary instability. And we all know there is no indication for surgery. You should teach the patient and you should stay away from surgery. Once you started surgery, the disaster is going to, is going to be there. It starts with the first procedure, the second procedure, normally 
these ladies are hyperlex. So you damage the proprioceps of the capsule and at the end you lead to a really unstable, painful shoulder, sometimes even necessitating an arthrodesis. So stay away. But the, there is a subset of patients definitely and which makes it so challenging in this area where it starts with a voluntary instability and then turning into an involuntary instability. And if you take a proper history, they tell you, yeah, well, in the past, it, I just put, pushed it out. It was just like fun. I just wanted to do it and to show my friends that I can push my shoulder out. But getting a weaker and weaker capsule, it starts then to be involuntary. So by, by just going, picking up something from the cupboard without doing it voluntarily, it pops out. So it becomes an involuntary instability. And these are the most challenging. And I think the arthroscopy is helpful in treating these patients. If you do a capsular, capsulography, of, if you do a capsular treatment, which we will discuss later, you, can, you don't burn bridges and you can maybe help them a little bit. So now we come up to the treatment of the posterior instability. Um, we can talk about the bone or the soft tissue pathology. For the bone, there's either a glenoid osteotomy and or a bone block procedure, open or arthroscopic. And if it is soft tissue pathology, you do a capsulography, open or arthroscopically. Well, this is the old fashioned Wilson osteotomy of the glenoid. Very challenging procedure. I have done not, not that many. It is, um, you have to take care not to completely fracture the glenoid. You have to be very careful to lift it up and to put in a bone block. Well, to lift it up to a proper extent without damaging the glenoid completely is quite a, a challenge, but it is possible to do. These are some older series, a large series of 32 patients, uh, good results, five years follow up, but you see quite often um, degenerative changes in the joints. And, the, and Hawkins, another old series where in, in this glenoid dysplasia, he saw a high rate of recurrence of instability and quite some complications, mainly the uh, osteoarthritis. So it is a really challenging procedure. And there is another issue. If you, it has been a case where it has been lifted up, but you have, you push your head forward and you can get a coracoid impingement. So you should consider coracoplasty if this really becoming painful anterior in the joint because you change the original anatomy and you should be aware of it. Well, the bone block has been used since long time. This is an older series of Gilles Lausch, posterior bone block, and he, had, he made an overhang. And generally they were satisfied. 40, not completely satisfied, but at least it improved the situation of the involuntary instability. And it is the way he did it, a little bit simplification. But if you have a bone block just overhang, you can imagine that at the end you will develop osteoarthritis in the posterior part of the joint. Several studies have described this osteoarthritis. So this is maybe a better solution, put in a bone block. You just make it as flat as the glenoid is and fix the capsule in between the bone graft and the glenoid. But you, if you have a retroverted gle, uh, a glenoid surface, you have to consider this glenoid osteotomy and put in this bone block to extend it, especially when you have a defect, a defect here in the posterior part of the glenoid due to the recurrent dislocation. You still can do the same. Try to level out this bone block and extend a little bit the surface of the glenoid. Well, you can do a bone block by arthroscopy if you don't have to do an, uh, an, uh, an osteotomy. Here, the, the, the guide is from posterior, from anterior, sorry, into the joints. Here is the posterior glenoids. Look into my posterior portal. I drill from anterior to drills and a sleeve. I started with this procedure for my anterior bone block, but you can use it for the, the same device as you see here from 
anterior having two parallel sleeves taking out the drill pass these loops and with the loops you with through your posterior cannula you bring in the bone block you need a large cannula and what you can do once you have done this you, you have still the wires to guide you you push it in always a little bit of a hassle keep away the labrum you see here these are the the wires and I now use this a small ball to keep it temporarily fixed and you just pull anterior on this black loop and you fix it here and your resident keep it tight you take out one of these and then along that loop wire you pass a screw because you have pre-drilled the block and pre-drilled the glenoid and you fix it with two screws as shown here and you can use a bone block as large as you need and then fix the labrum posteriorly so you can cover the bone block that is in these cases where there's just a defect and no severe dysplasia well the open capsulography has been described regarding the soft tissue repairs the first description was by near doing a t-shift like incision in the posterior capsule this is the teres minor and and you go in i will show you the approach later on and you just shift it over and under um, and retighten the capsule well the approach the original approach has been described is through the middle and the third part of the deltoid but Brodsky suggested a very clever solution making a vertical incision abduct the arm completely and you can go behind the glenoid behind the, gle uh, behind the deltoid you can approach the um, interval between infraspinatus and teres minor you easily can do the same when you do it open making a t-shift capsule and have an overlap reconstruction of your capsule tightening it and having your bone block next to it outside the joint so outside the capsule that is uh, that is the standard procedure nowadays well you can do an arthroscopic treatment of capsulography with or without liberal detachment and that can be if the labrum is involved you do the labrum as well capsulography or just the capsulography there is a little bit de debate if the rotator interval should be closed. Here, the way of capsulography, which is a quite innocent procedure. You just take whatever grasper you have, sharp grasper, to pass the suture. And I love to have PDS. I am awaiting till there is enough scar uh, formation and I have no sutures non-resorbable sutures left so you can really if you you roughen a little bit quite often in the patients the capsule is too thin to use the shaver if you use the shaver you easily make a hole in the capsule so just roughen it up taking this very simple stitches straightforward and as this is inferior as well as posterior and you can tighten the shoulder so the discussion is how many such as should be used. There are some cadaver studies. They found out that if you have a stitch of one centimeter, each one is reducing the volume about 10%. So you can use a severe reduction in very high prolapsed shoulders if you want to address the anterior parts as well, uh, like shown here. But normally this is sufficient and normally I include the inferior part as well. Well, the posterior labrum repair, I prefer the Wilmington portal, which is a portal one centimeter uh, uh, lateral to the posterior, in, posterior angle and one centimeter anterior. And you have the superior portal for drilling your anchors. This is a little bit too flat, the standard portal to drill in your, your anchors. You see here, 
sometimes it is a little bit difficult to approach it here. This is the other cannula I use. I insert my anchor and basically it is as easy as the anterior banker. Here I use my a sort of lasso loop. It is an acute pass of Smith and Nephew, but there are all sorts passers available where you can refix or reduce the labor with one suture through and one suture over. As long as you have the knot outside the glenoid joint, you don't have damage of your convol surface of the head damaging the articular cartilage. And you can here, you can do a capsulography as well as a tight labrum repair, making it very stable. This is very straightforward, very simple. Well, there wasn't sometimes ago already an, an analysis of open and soft tissue procedures in post instability, and both did well. So you can do it open and arthroscopic. And I think being all members of our arthroscopy society, if you do this procedure, I guess you do all this by an arthroscopic procedure. It's very, very easy to perform. So the results are generally good. And um, a recent study of Mauro uh, in at Leeds, 180 shoulders, the results were actually not dependent on the glenoid version, but they were better outcomes in increased glenoid. So if you increase the glenoid either with bone or with an abundant capsule and labrum, you have a better result. So he, they didn't see a big influence on the results on the version, but you have to deal with the version if necessary. So coming to the end, it is definitely more frequent because we start to discover these minor post instability, which were very often missed. And in the earlier times we said, well, it's about two to 5% of all instabilities. Now we all know we, there's enough evidence that there is at least 10% of all instabilities in the shoulder is posterior. So we should be aware of it. And with a history of instability, always test the posterior part of the joint. And both open and arthroscopic treatment are possible, except the glenoid osteotomy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yap. Uh, indeed, it was a wonderful oration. Uh, can you unshare your screen so we can... Yes, yes. Uh, uh, um... Done, done. Yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. Done. Okay, yeah. So there it was absolutely wonderful. And you really highlighted that uh, posterior instability accounts for around 10% of uh, unstable shoulders. And your uh, demonstration of reverse Hegel and capsular tears which are hidden and which are often missed are something which are an eye-opener for all of us. Uh, uh, let me welcome Dr. Samantha, Dr. Ranjit, all members of the executive committee who have joined, Dr. Rajiv yeah. Raman, and Dr. Sundar Rajan. So, yeah, everybody is here, the entire right. team of uh, executive committee here. Uh, so, uh, Samantha, would you want to just say hello to Yap? Yeah, Yap, yeah. yeah, just, just, I had yeah. Yeah, this, the, seven days back, we had a meeting with Jeff for, from the from Calcutta. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So, it was an excellent meeting that time okay. also. This, today also there is an uh, if, if you, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, a uh, lot of questions coming in. So, yes. uh, let us ask some of the questions. The first question which has come is, yeah, what is the role of uh, knotless anchors in posterior shoulder instability? All the repairs which we saw were knotted anchors. Yes. So, have you started? Yes. Do, have you do, uh, do you do some knotless as well in posterior instability repairs? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I have quite some experience with the knotless anchors. Uh, what I'm always a little bit worried with the anchors I used, you are not fully under control of the tightness of the knot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have torn my capsule, especially because the capsule is quite weak, that uh, by pulling on my sutures and pushing the knot downward in my knotless, I sometimes cut it my capsule. So I use it where there is not too much tension needed on the capsule, okay. more mainly superior and inferior. For that reason, I prefer not uh, knotted anchors and the metal suture with a knot outside of the labrum, outside of the joint. But it is debate. I know friends who do it always knotless and they're very happy. So it is a little bit personal preference. 
perfect i think the as you said it's the quality of tissue which is more important to decide yes. whether yes. you go for a not less amount yes uh, another question which has come uh, yap is that uh, when you do a global plication like you demonstrated for a patient who was uh, globally lax you always use a labrum itself as an anchor you take a bite yes. in the capsule and then take a bite in the labrum would well, you prefer that... anchors as well sometimes very good question very good question because in this hyperlax patients quite often the labrum is very poorly developed there's definitely a relation with a poor development of labrum and a and a very wide hyperlax capsule so if i am unable uh, to do it like i showed in the video i definitely use anchors and then i use anchors at 2 4 6 8 10 uh, that's at least 4 and sometimes even more if needed perfect in yeah. such scenario you would start with posterior plications and then go to anterior or you start with anterior and then go posterior yeah that's a good question yes i i i i did it starting anterior but you tighten up a little bit anterior and posterior is a little bit more challenging than anterior so i start posterior and right. then I, i then i start uh, basically um, at superior at the 11 o'clock position in the left shoulder then going to 9 then going to 7 and from anterior i start below at 5 3 and 1 if needed if needed okay yeah uh, yep, you said that there is a huge amount of role of glenoid versions also sometimes uh, to decide whether you really need to do an osteotomy in such cases yes what is the cut off of version is it uh, 11 degrees 14 degrees what exactly is the cut off of version that yeah. retroversion or dysplasia that you would decide probably the patient would need an osteotomy rather than an arthroscopic procedure yeah well that is <clears throat> that is a very important question um you know quite often if you see a shoulder with an glenoid dysplasia and patient had a normal shoulder till a recent trauma and there was following the mri just a labral avulsion there is no bony defect in these cases i think it makes sense just to restore the labrum try to restore the situation as it has been before the trauma another issue is if you have the same pathology but labrum detachment as well as due to recurrent dislocation when the patient is coming late to you there is a severe bony erosion of the posterior glenoid together with a severe retroversion these are the most challenging cases quite often it fails to just reconstruct the bone and then you have to consider the correction of the glenoid angle but there's always a balance it is a high risk procedure the glenoid osteotomy so it is not bad just to add bone where the defect is and wait and see what happens quite often they do well but if they do not well and they still recur then you need have to do osteotomy in my hands i've done in my career only about four or five glenoid osteotomies so it is not very often necessary but be aware that it can play a role so i i i guess all of you if you have a posterior instability you stand to do an a ct scan or an mri to rule out glenoid uh, glenoid version yeah and in, and in the population actually the the yeah. amount of yeah. retroversion the re- amount of retroversion can vary from a person to person so probably there yes. is no fixed angle about it yes amanda yeah. you- Yeah, because when we do when we do the anterior bone block for the arthroscopic way, we know the dimension of the bone bone block. But I have never done this uh, from the back side the bone block by arthroscopic. Uh, is, my question is that what is the bone uh, size? How you uh, dimension and how it is easy to pass the bone graft uh, through the scanula? Is there any trick that so that we can try later somehow? Yeah, the. Uh, I, I hope I understood your question. Um, let me j- just pick up the telephone for one moment. Someone sure. is calling. Link, can I straks even terugbellen? Yeah. Um, 
basically, uh, I figure out with the CT, CT scan how big the defect is. And since we cannot use the coracoid for a posterior problem, we use the iliac crest. So you can size the defect. And it is so easily with an iliac crest to, to make a very nice rounded block. Although you can use a rectangular block as well, as long as we know that according to Wolf's law, it will adapt in the long term. So at least it should be big enough to cover most of the defect. And normally a two to one to one centimeter bone block is enough for the posterior defects. Uh, is there a cutoff bone loss? Like for uh, anterior bone loss, we say around 20%, 25% are critical and we would need to do a bony procedure. For posterior bone loss, is there a, a, a definite uh, quantification that above more than 15% loss or 20% loss, we should add on a bone block? Yeah, very, very, very good question. Basically, since we have so many data now on the anterior defects and so many large series that nowadays more or less 13, 15% is a cutoff point, but uh, in, in the, we don't have these data for posterior. And well, my personal experience is if it is more than 15%, I do a bony procedure, and in the other cases, I just do a tightening of the capsule and making a big bumper of my labrum and try to do it with just soft tissue. So it is 15% for me, for me personally. But that is not much evidence for that. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Dr. Vivek Pandey said hello, hello to you. He's uh, yeah. wishing you good evening. Uh, he has yes. a question for you for, from Vivek. He says, when you do a capsular plication, would you tighten anterior more or posterior more? So how do you balance the tissue? Well, if it is a straight posterior instability, I just do a tightening posterior. I don't over tighten anterior. So and, and uh, if, if my patient is hyper hyperlex, very redundant capsule, I, I actually I involve also an anterior application, but not as tight as posterior. Posterior is the most important. And inferior. I think inferior, you all are aware, if you pull, uh, if, by example, compare with an anterior labrum lesion. If you pull at six o'clock at the labrum, you see tightening of the inferior and even the posterior inferior capsule. Well, that's the same for your posterior instability. I, I lift my labrum superior and then tighten my capsule or I tighten my capsule with an anchor at the nearly six o'clock position. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, the question is, if there is a patient who you see is a voluntary dislocator, and as you said, has over a period of time has become an involuntary dislocator, on an MRI shows a labrum tear, would you then operate this patient? Yes, well, basically if patient is not, and we, I didn't discuss it, these patients, they should, if they become involuntary, they should go at least six months to a very good physiotherapist. Okay. Quite often they do better. If they do not, then I consider to do just <clears throat> the capsulography I showed. I, uh, I, I don't involve too much. I just try to tighten the capsule and leave it with that. No other, other procedures. Uh, how often do you do a uh, CT of the other Does shoulder? Answer the question, or didn't? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, question is, how often would you do a CT of other shoulder to see uh, the bone loss and version changes on the affected shoulder? Yeah, that, yeah. I like this question because so often you see if it is a glenoid, uh, a congenital glenoid version, or if it's bigger a dysplasia, very very often it is bilateral. Very rarely I see it unilateral. Well, as long as that shoulder is not uh, is not symptomatic, I don't think there is a use a need to do a CT of the contralateral side. Um, it can be useful to measure how big the bone defect is if you are a little bit confused and if it is not really a complete circle, then you know how big the defect is compared to the other one. But for the dysplasia, it is not necessary to do it. Yeah, Ranjit, you have a question, you say? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, Ranjit. Yeah, like, uh, hello, Jeff. Hi, Ranjit, good to see you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really a very good talk. And uh, like your uh, Rampli for heel sacks defects. Yeah. 
what are your indications of arthroscopic meclaglin for the reverse yield checks or you don't do meclaglin for uh, reverse yield checks yes i i do it yes it is, well the meclaglin is 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 a bony operation huh? it is um, I, I, it is basically a ramplicize of the subscap. Maybe we should not call it McLovelin, but because McLovelin described that you do an osteotomy of your minor tuberosity and put that minor tuberosity inside the defect. Well, what, what you do with the ramplicize of the subscap is basically fixing the subscap tendon into the defect, which is a bit different. It's quite easy to do, quite straightforward. You limit a little bit the uh, external rotation and internal rotation but not, not that severe. And it is straightforward. You put in two anchors normally and you pass it through and you, you can easily tie your sutures subcutaneously outside the, uh, the subscap and have an, uh, have an, an uh, reverse remplissage. So what, I, is, what is yeah, the arm position? Are, when, okay. What is the arm position when you st uh, stitch it uh, at that position? Well, doesn't make much difference. Normally, most of the patients I do on leather decubitus, um, you can't over tighten, you just do in situ, you fix the tendon into the bone. You don't tighten it, but yeah, you, do, you limit it a little bit rotation. Yeah. Do you do it uh, for all uh, reverse yield sacs? No, or no, no, no. To so what if are I, your indications? Yeah, well, that is a little bit subjective. The, the one, uh, I showed one picture that was very broad, large if you well basically the rule of thumb is if you have done your posterior uh, placation and labral fixation take the outer arm and internal rotate and see if it is engaging over that labrum that might that is for me a reason to do a drum passage. so if it is a very wide ill sex engaging after your labrum and fixation and capsule placation, internal rotates in all directions and see if it is engaging. That might be increase that might increase the chance of recurrence of the instability mm -hmm. when that engages. Yeah. So the wider or if it is very deep, a deep one, not that wide, can also engage in that way. So there are you know several ways, several types of hill sex lesions. I'm more afraid of the wide ones, but some very deep ones uh, with uh, smaller width can cause the same problem. So just test during the procedure. And that is the good thing that we do with all arthroscopic that makes it so, uh, so uh, easier. Yeah. Rajiv, you, you have a question? Hello, yeah. Greeting from Calcutta. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So for posterior bony block, you use the standard posterior portal or you do some modification? Yeah, I, I use basically two, two portals. Um, my uh, working portal is the standard little bit superior portal um, to say coming in at about the uh, 11 o'clock position and bringing in the bone <coughs> block. I use a um, trans uh, infraspinatus uh, more or less at the, at the nine o'clock level. So to put in uh, and with a large cannula. Well, you can, even if you have a little bit of a problem, you can, it doesn't, make a big sense to make a small incision and use your thumb to bring in the bone block. Yeah. But it's not a big issue. As long as you follow the anatomical planes, it is not uh, not that difficult. But you, if you, you can't get a very large cannula to pass a 10 millimeter bone block, you need at least a 12 millimeter cannula to pass it. And you want to have a considerable bone block, then, uh, then you use a mini open. It's not a, not a big issue. Yep, in a posterior dislocator, sometimes there is an articular cartilage damage in the posterior inferior part of labrum. So would you actually pull the labrum to cover that articular defect? Yes. Yeah, there's a big debate, but I like that. Yeah, I keep it away. Once you have a bareless piece of joint, it will, it's the first start of osteoarthritis. And if you cover it with soft tissue, you have two advantages. You cover the defect and you tighten your posterior structures. So uh, definitely an, an advantage. Advantage. Yes. Uh, would uh, like for anterior bank cut, we always put at least three anchors, sometimes four. Yes. Is there a formula for posterior as well that you need at least three or maybe just even two anchors are enough? Yeah, well, there's not, not much evidence. We know from the anterior that you need at least two anchors. 
So basically, I use three anchors, yes, for posterior as well. Um, if it is a minor, minor labrum lesion from to say six to nine o'clock, you can consider two anchors. But um, I'm quite liberal in my anchors. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rajesh has asked a question. He says that some surgeons, when they do anterior instability, they extend the labrum tear from 5.30 to around 6.30 extend and then do a repair. Yes. Would you do the same for posterior instability, extend it from maybe 7 to come back to 5 and then repair it or you just repair it in C2? Yes, I, I repair it in C2. That is the, the, all the debate. What is the importance of the inferior capsule tightening it in anterior instability? And I love to do it anteriorly, to tighten the, in, so beyond the anterior bend, that inferior capsule to tighten it, and then, uh, and then uh, tighten the anterior part of the shoulder. Actually, the, if the labrum detachment is all around to anterior, I definitely do the same. I try to bring in an anchor as low as possible. Basically, I use an, uh, if you go very low through your teres minor, just with a drill guide, you can get in nearly to the six o'clock, so say 6.30 to put in your anchor. And then you can shift that anterior part or put in an anchor at five o'clock and fix the anchor over there. Well, there are cases and probably you have seen them where there is an, uh, both an anterior and posterior, what we call the global labor lesion, especially in heavy, heavy trauma, uh, heavy fall or heavy accident, then uh, you have to address, and then you can uh, stick with a five and a seven o'clock anchor, and then you don't need to go that inferior with your anchor. Uh, yep, you have an extensive experience, both of open shoulder surgery and arthroscopic shoulder surgery. In cases where you want to do a capsular plication, is an open needs capsule refi much better where you can actually overlap the capsule and do much better than an arthroscopy? What, what is your take on that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the problem with the arthroscopy is that it is a bit difficult to reproduce the T-shift of capsulography as a near showed. Well, the, the clinical studies so far show that doing an arthroscopic or an open application of capsulography lead to the same results. A little bit less good as, as the anterior, but they lead to the same, same good result. So the, the advantage of doing application is uh, counteracted by the advantage of the arthroscopic procedure that you don't burn bridges. You don't have to make a large incision. You do just a uh, capsul capsulography either uh, posterior or posterior or inferior, you don't burn bridges for later. You don't do much damage. Mm -hmm. And that is the same why I like this procedure in these patients where the voluntary uh, became involuntary. If you do an arthroscopic procedure, you don't damage much of the proprioceps of the capsule. We know that all the nerves are just around the labrum in the capsule. And if you cut it all open, you cut a little bit of the, the, the neural septors. And if you do it arthroscopically the way I showed, it is very easy, very straightforward and very effective and not burning bridges. So I think the advantage of arthroscopic is now being proven without even reproducing the T-shift. But at the T-shift, if you are not, not very experienced with the arthroscopic, then a T-shift open is getting the same proper results. So it, I'm not abandoning it. I'm not blaming it. But I think arthroscopic is, uh, is nowadays uh, as good and more convenient, especially for all of us arthroscopists. It is the future. Thank you. Uh, Sundar, you had a question. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So when Hi, you Sundar. have uh, post lesion uh, extend to the biceps tendon that is slap lesion with posterior labral lesion because yes. traditionally you told you start with posterior first to, to start the repair uh, we used to always think that that slap uh, tension is very important so we start with slap repair first then you extend the anterior or posterior level repair so yeah. still you do posterior level repair first then you come back to the slap yeah if it is a, a slap lesion which is repairable i definitely repairable. use yeah, if it is repairable, I definitely use an uh, anchor at the uh, 11, 11.30 position, not at the 12, 12 o'clock position, 
not tightening it too completely. I, I prefer only to do a post superior slab fixation and then proceed to inferior to fix the whole, uh, the whole labrum. So uh, definitely slab, slab is sometimes involved. And the same like, like you have in the original Maffet uh, type five uh, uh, anterior labrum and, uh, and slab lesion, this, uh, the, this, you have the same at the posterior. Repair, not repairable, tenodesis. I, I do it always a tenodesis in these young athletes. So if yeah. in, in isolated, oh, sorry, can I ask one more? Yeah, yes, yeah, so yeah. In isolated posterior labral repair, so when you do repair, uh, you do you include the capsule or do you repair only the la uh, labral? Um, depends a little bit. If um, um, maybe I can show a little bit here. If you have your labrum and your capsule is quite quite redundant, I include the capsule. If you have your first look into the shoulder, if the capsule, if the labrum is still off and the capsule is not that redundant, I leave it with the labrum repair. But very often there is a redundancy of the capsule, and that might be um, belonging to the patient. It might be related to the posterior subluxation, stretching out the capsule, as we know from cadaveric studies that first the capsule stretches and then the labrum is torn off. So to be honest, the majority, I include the capsule. Maybe 80, 90%, I include the capsule with the labrum repair. And there is not, not a very big problem. You limit internal rotation, but for most of these patients, well, if you, at least might have a problem. Uh, well, normally a problem, a thrower has more problems with the limitation of the external rotation, yeah. but the limitation of the internal rotation is not that of a problem during the sport. Uh, yeah, you talked about uh, uh, interval closure, but you said yes. you will elaborate later. So what yeah. about interval closure? Would you still do it or you stop doing it? Yeah, there's so much debate also in uh, related to anterior instability. Uh, well, what I I'm, have a practical approach. If, if it looks stretched, if it looks torn, if it looks abnormal, I just include it. It is not a big issue. It's quite easy to do it arthroscopically with one or two sutures. Um, uh, I, I can show, I can look for a video to show it, but otherwise it is quite straight, straightforward. Um, and then I include it. So I look very much to uh, the tissue itself. But if it looks completely normal, a very nice uh, superior glenohumeral ligament, um, nice capsule, no redundancy, just beyond the labrum at the one o'clock position, then I leave it. Okay, okay. Uh, what about the graft placement when you do a posterior uh, bony augmentation procedure? So you do, as we saw, it was a rectangular graft and you were yeah. putting it parallel to the glenoid, uh, not superior to the glenoid. Yeah, it, 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 a little bit lower than the glenoid. Slightly, yeah, a little bit lower. Yeah. But in the yeah. demonstrations, which the pictures you were showing of other authors, they yeah. were slightly prominent. Uh, yes. So, so, but why do you keep it uh, a bit low down? Yeah, uh, basically that I use it basically for cases where there is a bony defect posteriorly, uh, and uh, the picture I showed was from uh, I think from Walsh, where he treated those with a uh, glenoid, uh, se rather severe glenoid version to oh, try to restore the bone and and making a sort of well not correction of the version. So. You can use, and I'm a little bit afraid if you have a little bit overhang of the bone block, even if you have the capsule in between, that it leads to earlier osteoarthritis. So that is uh, that I'm afraid of. Okay, so friends, so Sundar, Ranjit, uh, Rajiv, Samantha, uh, Sandeep, any questions? So, or before we come to the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I think yeah. Jeff has already been done a great job on that posterior instability. Most of the questions have already been answered. Absolutely wonderful. As usual, Yap, you had been wonderful. We were sticking right on time. It's a, a, a full one hour. And uh, thank you for answering all the questions very, very lucidly. Keep on guiding Indian Arthroscopy Society on international platforms as you always are. And we are all together. Thank you very much. Stay safe and uh, take care, Yap. Thank you. I thank you all so much. And it was so good to see my old friends again. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank good, you day. good day. Bye bye. Uh, friend, bye bye. Uh, friends, tomorrow we have uh, uh, our innovative arthroscopy uh, webinar. We had got a lot of uh, 
people who wanted to share their innovative techniques. So this is second now uh, webinar in the series. We have another one on 31st. Uh, tune in tomorrow at 6 p.m. for the second uh, Aak Nirbhar uh, Innovative Arthroscopy Symposium. And all the speakers are mem members of Indian Arthroscopy Society who have their own innovative way of treating and managing new things. Hope we learn uh, new, new technology and new techniques uh, from our Indian uh, fellows. Thank you very much and have a nice Thank you. Day.